Hello again and welcome to this, the third collaborative education module put together by the North Carolina Healthcare Association and the Advisory Board Company. My name is Connor O'Brien. I'm a faculty member at the Advisory Board's head office in Washington, D.C. Uh, this third module uh, is entitled Preparing Your Advocacy Story. It's the final uh, in our series of public policy uh, jointly produced modules. And why don't we dive right in? Um, we will proceed in three steps across the next few minutes. Uh, the first step is a quick review of some central points from our prior two modules. So let's have a quick look at our story so far. Um, in module number one, we uh, shone a light on uh, what turns out to be a crossroads moment in American healthcare. Um, recently, uh, as shown on the right-hand side of this graphic, uh, our expenses uh, began to grow faster per year than the growth in our revenues, costs growing faster than revenue. Now, this is an unsustainable circumstance for any kind of business, but it's particularly thorny and problematic for a healthcare enterprise. Uh, first, the work we do is so vitally important. Uh, second, so many people uh, are directly affected by what we do uh, in the communities uh, counting on us. Um, and third, let's not forget, we are a narrow margin business to begin with. There's not a lot of wiggle room to get cost wrong. Um, so a call to action, what made us great to this point, um, probably needs to be revisited. And we must recognize that we, uh, how to put this, that it's not sufficient to sit idly by um, as forces around us change uh, the way we do business for us. Which took us to module number two. Um, and building on that notion, uh, uh, we introduced the idea of uh, an ecosystem, health providers, uh, whether they are uh, uh, medical practices, uh, hospitals, integrated delivery networks, they do not exist as islands unto themselves. Uh, rather, they are participants, actors in an ecosystem. Now, that means that there are forces acting upon them from outside, but also that they can shape those forces uh, from within and indeed uh, adapt to those forces by organizing and reorganizing internally. Uh, we identified four uh, particular ecosystem forces uh, back in that second module. They were the economy, demographics, technology, and the force of public policy. And for our purposes in this series, we're focusing on public policy, which brings this graphic back to mind. This is a summary of the public policy process. It proceeds in five steps or phases from recognition and agenda setting at the top to implementation at the bottom. And importantly, there's a an ongoing feedback loop here. Once uh, a policy is implemented on the ground, it often prompts another discussion, um, recognizing uh, additional issues. Uh, should the policy be changed? Uh, do we need uh, another policy? Should it be rescinded? So uh, the public policy process is ongoing. Um, and because it is an ecosystem force, um, we as providers want to shape it to the extent we can, instead of just reacting to it. Uh, now, we gave a number of examples from around the country, terrific examples, we think, of, uh, of health systems doing precisely this. Here is just one of them by way of quick review. Um, Children's Colorado directly interacting with state legislators in the Capitol um, to uh, defeat uh, the repeal of a soda tax. Um, I wanted to cite this one particular example because it calls to mind what you're going to be doing shortly when you travel to Raleigh for your legislative visits. Um, more examples uh, in the prior module if you want to go back and review them, but all of them taken together, uh, combined with the notion of public policy as an ecosystem force, um, allow us, I think, to restate uh, a higher aspiration. So to repeat, it is not good enough because of the importance of our work uh, merely to stand idly by as we are whipsawed by external forces, including policy change. No, we want to make sure that we are shaping that force uh, to the extent we can. And I think if we take that to its logical conclusion, we can state a new aspiration, and that is to actually be out in front of that policy process. We've seen some examples of this um, in the healthcare space around the country. Um, I want to call uh, to your attention one particular example. Uh, it's a good one. It's the Geisinger Health Network up in Pennsylvania. 
And again, our aspiration here is to be out in front of the policy process. As far back as 2006, Geisinger began to offer what they called healthcare with a warranty. Essentially, it was a firm fixed price for um, a, a medical case or a, a surgical intervention. So let's say you wanted to get a knee replaced. Geisinger would quote you a price for that, and then they would guarantee that uh, for a month prior to that procedure and for three months after, if anything unforeseen happened, a, a complication, uh, some additional workup that they uh, had not anticipated, they would eat the cost of that. Geisinger would. Uh, no extra charge. Uh, and so you know exactly how you're going to be out of pocket. Now, I want to pause on that for uh, a second. Uh, just to think about the uh, the operational and clinical rigor that has to be brought to bear to be able to make that guarantee to the folks in the community in the first place, um, identifying ahead of time, way upstream, when there were possible complications. Is this case more complex uh, than a garden variety uh, knee replacement, for example? Um, that all has to be whipped into shape to a degree of predictability uh, before you can make an internal commitment to price control and clinical outcome, never mind uh, making that promise externally. Uh, but as Geisinger uh, brought that operational rigor uh, to bear, uh, they saw uh, a, a number of clinical benefits as well. And that's uh, summarized here on this graphic. Um, in, in 2006, concomitant with their offer of a healthcare, uh, you know, healthcare with a warranty, uh, they began to see readmissions within 30 days declining on their coronary artery bypass graft uh, procedures, for example. 44% reduction in that same year that they went public with their firm fixed price approach to open heart surgery. By 2008, they're seeing readmissions reduced on other clinical cases as well. We're highlighting uh, congestive heart failure on this uh, graphic. All of this years in advance of the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which of course happened in 2010. Now, if you cast your eye to the far right of this graphic, you'll see that by 2014, more than three quarters of American hospitals um, were being penalized for high readmissions in things like uh, CHF, cabbage, uh, and so on. Geisinger was not one of them. And the reason was because, um, A, they had been out in front of that policy change uh, by um, uh, steering their operation in this direction in advance of the passage of legislation. And B, not surprisingly, perhaps, Geisinger was at the table as CMS was putting together rules and regulations around um, a program to reduce 30-day readmissions. Again, our aspiration here was to be out in front of the policy process. So when this became policy, Geisinger was able to nail it because they had anticipated that this is where the market was going and they had been consulted um, about the policy change. This is where we want to be as well. And if that sounds like a tall order, I'd like to call your attention to the way legislators um, and furthermore, rule makers view your expertise because it turns out there is a tremendous appetite for it. Here's a quote um, uh, from a former congressman. And it, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but I love how this just strips off all the varnish and indicates to us why we must be involved um, in the public policy process. He says, lawmakers will never know as much about your industry as you do. They will never know as much about your issues as you do. And they will not know that it's as important to you as it is until you tell them. We started with a call to action because of the, the business conundrum of facing our industry. Costs outstripping revenues. We recognize that public policy is an ecosystem force, which means that we have a role in shaping it. And here we hear, um, uh, you know, a, a member of the federal legislature saying, please come in and let us know what's happening on the ground so that we get policy right. Now, to an extent, I know I may be preaching to the converted on this. Uh, you're looking forward to some legislative visits in Raleigh in the coming months. That's great. But I want to make sure that uh, this uh, message is being passed far and wide uh, and that we are participating as actively as possible uh, to make sure that uh, that policy is gotten right. Which brings us to the final part of this discussion. I'm going to turn you loose on a couple of exercises to prepare you for those legislative visits. 
you want to begin to craft a, an advocacy story and turn that into an advocacy plan. Now, let's talk about how we can do that. And to do that, I'd like to turn our attention back to some of those policy success stories I drew your attention to in Modules 2 and the Geisinger example that I just gave you a moment ago. What do they all have in common? Um, four things in particular, and those four things uh, come together in a, a stepwise approach for you to prepare your advocacy story and begin to turn it into a plan. The first is to identify collaboration partners, and these are partners uh, pretty much within the healthcare industry. They come from a couple of sources. The first is internal to your own organization. And the first of those is your government affairs office or your chief lobbyist. If you have an internal arm that is devoted to that, terrific. Uh, pick up the phone and uh, establish contact with them. If, it, if you don't have an internal a government affairs office, many uh, organizations um, have a, an external lobbying firm uh, that they have retained. Uh, same idea here. These folks have a lot of miles walked in the public policy process, so they are very, very strong partners who can point out how you can make your advocacy more effective. But it's not just limited to those specialists in government affairs. You've also got motivated colleagues um, whom you identify, uh, just to uh, state it baldly, um, through water cooler conversations. These are folks that you find um, you're having not just clinical conversations with them, but you're talking about the policy environment, the impact of certain CMS rule changes on how you deliver uh, healthcare on the ground. Uh, make sure that uh, you not only identify these folks, but bring them into your discussions uh, as you begin to put together your uh, advocacy story. Now, you also have an external uh, source of collaboration partners within the healthcare industry. So we're going to cast our net a little broader here. Think about um, the North Carolina Healthcare Association, for example. NCHA uh, is the sort of industry or trade or professional organization that you want to be uh, uh, consulting with um, uh, to leverage uh, your message uh, in the policy arena. And beyond that, um, some organizations that you may, if you weren't looking through the lens of policy, uh, consider as competitors um, these can be terrific collaboration partners as well. Uh, think of the healthcare system down the road against whom you compete for patient volumes. Well, actually, they can be a strong collaboration partner um, uh, on a particular matter of policy. You might be in agreement on that, and they can help lend a voice um, and amplify that voice. Okay, uh, that's the first of the four uh, uh, components uh, to uh, put together an effective advocacy plan. Let's move on to the second one in the middle of this slide. You want to identify allies in the ecosystem. Let's cast our net a little broader still and go beyond the healthcare industry. Uh, nonprofits, political groups, uh, activists. A good organization here um, is the American Association of Retired Persons. AARP represents people over 50 on a broader range of issues in the, in the policy arena. One of them is healthcare, even though, strictly speaking, they are not a healthcare membership organization. But there might be times when, for example, NCHA might ally with AARP. So you want to think about, uh, since healthcare is one-fifth of the American economy, it affects a lot of people who wouldn't ordinarily consider themselves as part of a healthcare organization. Um, elder folks, um, uh, uh, parents of uh, pediatric patients uh, with uh, certain conditions. Uh, these are, are natural allies uh, outside our industry group that we want to make sure we are considering when we think about hmm, how do we put this story together, how do we amplify it, how do we leverage it so that it has uh, maximal impact. All right, let's move on to step three here. Um, uh, armed with your list of partners and allies, you want to begin to develop your advocacy story. And then number four, you want to implement it in a multimodal way. So how do you, how exactly do you begin steps three and four? Well, let's take a look here. And by do, in, in doing so, let's consider a live issue, a certificate of need. All right, I'm going to turn you loose, as I mentioned a moment ago, on a couple of exercises concerning certificate of need. Um, in 35 states, including your home state of North Carolina, a CON is required before you build new healthcare facilities. Now, CON laws were passed um, to prevent excess hospital capacity, and they are issued state by state um, by those uh, uh, designated state authorities. And in your case, it's uh, the NC Department of Health and Human Services. Okay, uh, so not a novel idea, CONs. However, more recently, there's been mounting criticism 
of those laws from some quarters within healthcare. These critics contend that requiring a certificate essentially grants monopoly privileges to hospitals and health systems that are already on the ground and operating. This may result in unnecessary shortages of healthcare supply. And for microeconomics 101, where there's a supply crimp, uh, that could lead to higher prices for consumers, in this case, patients. Now, let's think about this notion that we might change or even rescind CON rules. And I'd like you to think about that possibility from the perspective of four different groups active in healthcare. The first is doctors, the second, nurses, the third, patients, and finally, payers. Think about the proposed change or a proposed change in CON requirements from the perspective of each of, the, uh, each of those four particular groups. Now, you may well imagine uh, that on some of, uh, of these issues, you will be in agreement with some of those other groups, but on others, you may be opposing. Uh, the point is, you want to put on a, a diff, a, 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 the, the perspective, the, 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 the viewpoint, the, the goggles, if you will, of that particular group. And there's a reason for doing this, because as you do that, um, it'll turn out uh, that you may identify uh, uh, areas of agreement and areas of disagreement. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do specifically. From the perspective of each of those four specific groups, think about and list three positive and three negative implications of rescinding certificate of need requirements in North Carolina. In so doing, your allies and likely opponents may actually surface and become more apparent to you. Um, go ahead and uh, pause this playback for a few minutes. Think about those four different groups. Here they are again. And then when you come back, um, we'll take it a step further. I'll be with you in just a moment. Welcome back to the module. Again, we're considering the perspectives of four different groups um, on whether or not they would be a, a, a proponents of or opponents against uh, changing CON requirements in North Carolina. And the reason we do that is because uh, we want to identify our allies and our likely opponents, because that can take us to the next step of uh, advocacy storytelling and advocacy planning. Remember, we said you want to uh, begin to tell your story with your allies uh, and then implement it, execute it in a multimodal way. Let's talk about those modes. Um, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to introduce you to nine of them that are appropriate at various points in the public policy process. All right, let's talk about early in the process, um, in the uh, agenda setting um, or political phases. You've got three public opportunities here to get your story out mm -hmm. and noticed. On the left, media campaigns writing to newspapers at the local, uh, regional, or even national level, uh, op-ed pieces, letters to the editor, uh, and so on. Um, in the middle, presenting expertise in the form of research, um, issue briefs, impact analyses, um, the summaries of which might get published uh, more broadly. And let's not forget over on the right, citizen activation, um, events, rallies, and so on, um, do we help organize them? Should we participate in those that are already uh, being organized? Great opportunities here in the public arena uh, to begin to get your message out. So there's the first three modes. Let's proceed to the middle of the public policy process. This is the enactment phase when legislation is being debated and passed. You have opportunities here uh, to make your opinion and your advocacy story heard as well. The one on the left hand side, you're going to uh, recognize directly because you're already planning to do this. This is direct influence um, with legislators, which is what you're um, looking forward to doing in Raleigh in short order. But that's not the only one. There are other ways to deliver your content expertise in the middle here um, in uh, committee testimony where there are legislative hearings um, or, in fact, actually aiding in the drafting of legislation or parts of legislation. And then finally, on the right, direct support through fundraising, uh, endorsements of candidates or uh, uh, issues. On this particular one, it's really important to be in close touch with your government affairs office or your chief lobbyist um, and your general counsel's office. And the reason for this is there are very specific rules around how we may support directly, particularly around fundraising. So I just call attention to that to make sure that your activities in this regard are not merely effective, but they are also lawful. 
Okay. Um, let's go to our final three modes here for consideration, and this is later in the public policy process at the regulatory phase. So once law is passed, when the regulators are promulgating rules around how this will actually be implemented, you still, even though the horses have left the barn at the legislature, you still have an opportunity to uh, impact uh, how those laws will be implemented. Um, on the left, by uh, responding to public comments. Now, under law, uh, uh, regulatory organizations have 30 or 60 or 90, usually, days um, to uh, ask for and receive public written comment on the rules that they propose. Go ahead and take them up on that opportunity and let them know how those rules will affect the day-to-day -day practice of healthcare in your neck of the woods. In the middle, even outside of the formal uh, public comment periods, um, you can petition those regulating agencies. Um, to consider changes um, in those rules. And let's not forget over on the right that those regulatory agencies convene hearings in a way similar to the, the way the legislature does it. In this case, it's not to affect how the law is drafted, it's to affect how the law is implemented. So in broad strokes, there are nine modes, nine chances, nine opportunities to make sure that your advocacy story is um, reiterated and emphasized and heard throughout the public policy process. And so our final exercise for this module is to uh, begin to give your um, advocacy plan um, more shape. I want you to recall the divergent and convergent, the overlapping views that serviced in that last exercise where you considered certificate of need um, from the standpoint of four different groups in healthcare. How would you attempt to influence the following to adopt your position with your allies on certificate of need. Um, those, I'd like you to consider this across three groups. One is a citizen action group that isn't necessarily directly affiliated with the healthcare industry. The second is a lawmaker. Um, the third is a rule maker um, who will shape law into regulation. So citizen action group, legislator, and regulator. Consider uh, the rescinding of CON rules um, and how you would deploy some of the nine modes that I just alerted you to um, across the various phases of the pol public policy process to influence these particular groups or individuals. Once again, go ahead and pause the playback, uh, give this some consideration, jot down some notes. Those notes will be helpful to you when you come to Raleigh, and I'll be with you in just a moment. Welcome back to the module. I want to thank you for your attention and thought and note taking uh, uh, during this discussion uh, in anticipation of your legislative visits in the state capitol uh, sometime down the road. We are on to uh, consideration of what to do next. First and foremost, uh, let's recognize what we have learned uh, across these three modules. Um, first, uh, the ground is moving underneath our feet in the healthcare industry. A call to action because our ability to fulfill mission is threatened. We cannot stand idly by as those changes uh, happen all around us and affect us. We must shape them as the participant in uh, an ecosystem. One of the ecosystem forces that has a huge impact on us is the force of public policy. And it is advocacy planning um, that allows certain healthcare systems, effective ones, to shape that ecosystem force, to get out in front of the public policy process. In addition, I'd like you to consider a couple of specific questions. Number one, how can I hone, how can I sharpen the advocacy story I've begun to articulate in this module? All right, and with whom can I collaborate on that to sharpen it and indeed amplify it? Uh, the second question, how can I most effectively amplify my advocacy story in each of the five phases of the public policy process that we introduced in the second module? You'll probably be uh, deploying different modes uh, in different phases, but that's all to the good and becoming more familiar with that will make you more effective. Finally, um, continue by collaborating with your government affairs department, with your lobbying firms if you're uh, deploying those, and with the North Carolina Healthcare Association as you prepare for your legislative action um, and other roles in the public policy process. Once again, I wanna thank you for participating in this. Uh, my name is Connor O'Brien from the Advisory Board co uh, Company in Washington, DC. I wish you all the best of luck and success uh, as you work together with NCHA. And at some point down the road, I hope we get the chance to talk about um, how it's going out there. In the meantime, thanks again, 
and all the best.